All right, take your Bible tonight, if you would please, to the book of Esther. Esther chapter 4, please. Esther chapter 4, 17 verses in chapter 4. And Esther 4, we'll begin reading just a little bit more, if you would. Uh, Esther 4, we'll start reading with verse number 1. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And, every, and in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai, and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai under the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him, and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave him a copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make requests before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. And Esther spake unto Hatak, and gave him commandment unto Mordecai, all the king's servants and the people of the king's province, Provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such as to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come into the king these thirty days. They told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Let's stop there for now and we'll pray together. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together here and to open up your word and study it together. I pray, Lord, that it, you've commanded us in your word that we would all tonight study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so, Lord, help us this evening as we look into this continuing story of Esther that you have put in your word. Help us to glean tonight from it the truths that would help us and would help mold us and make us to be better servants of yours, uh, truths that might help us to be a little more like Jesus because we were in church this evening. So, Spirit of God, speak to hearts and do what only you can do in these next few moments that we spend together looking into your word. And I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's review so far. We uh, King Ahasuerus said... Um, made the big feast and invited everybody to come and was showing his strength and his might uh, to all the provinces and such. And then he, um, uh, it, during that six-month feast, uh, he got drunk and he wanted to show off Queen Vashti and uh, show her off to the other men. Well, Queen Vashti, what? Refused. She said, no, I'm not going to do that. And so she was cast away from the king and a contest was made for a successor. Uh, to the queen. The Persian beauty contest was underway, and uh, Esther was chosen. Uh, Esther's a young Jewish lady, um, a cousin. She was a young cousin of Mordecai, and she was chosen to be the next queen. Now, during this time, there was a man who had risen to some prominence in the kingdom. In fact, he'd been exalted by the king, 
and uh, his name was Haman. And uh, we found out last week, Haman was an Agagite, and uh, that was the king of the Amalekites, if you remember, that Saul was to have utterly destroyed, and he didn't. And uh, they, 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 now they wiped out a lot of them, and uh, Haman, I'm sure, knows that story. And when he finds out that Mordecai is a Jew, and uh, everyone is bowing down and giving reverence to Haman, but not Mordecai, he refuses to bow. And he finds out that he doesn't just bow uh, because he doesn't like him. He doesn't bow because he's a Jew. Uh, then Haman decides, I want to not just kill Mordecai. I want to wipe out all the Jews. I want to uh, utterly destroy all of them. And so he gets the king to sign a decree and gets the king's ring, his signet, and he seals the deal. And so he's uh, kind of pressured the king into having all the Jews exterminated. That's where we ended last week, was decrees gone out, uh, the death notice is, is made, and uh, that's where we're going to pick it up right now in Esther chapter 4, because the first thing we see as we look into chapter 4 is Mordecai's grief, his grief. The first thing he did, you see in verse 1, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, he rent his clothes, now that means he tore his clothes, and put sackcloth, put on sackcloth with ashes, and went out in the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry. So he rents his clothing, which was a sign of mourning and an expression of horror. Uh, if you remember when, when, when Reuben came back after Joseph had been put in the pit, Reuben was not there. When he came back and he found out they sold Joseph, he came back expecting to get him out of the pit. And he came back, Joseph wasn't there. The Bible says he rent his clothes. He was uh, in great horror over what had happened. Uh, Jacob, when he was grieved, rent his clothes. When Job heard about the death of his children, he tore his clothes. It was always the sign of somebody in great mourning and someone in great horror. The, the, what we read about this evening from the brother Maskey, if, if uh, when this happened to losing his twins and losing his wife, he would have tore his clothes. Uh, great mourning and great horror at what had taken place. And so uh, Mordecai is expressing great horror at the commandment that's been given. Great horror that's been issued that uh, all the Jews are to be exterminated. All right? Then he not only tore his clothes, the Bible says he put on sackcloth. Now sackcloth was usually made out of goat's hair and uh, literally it was a sack with holes cut in it uh, for the arms and the legs and uh, worn... Uh, usually over some clothing, but it was a public announcement whenever you saw somebody in sackcloth that they were in official mourning. They would put ashes on their head and uh, let people know that they were in mourning. Sackcloth, you'll read that in the prophets. Oftentimes they put on sackcloth to let them know they're mourning over the sins of the nation. And so it was a, it was a garment unusual for captives to wear sackcloth. And so Mordecai letting, is letting everybody know quite publicly uh, that he is upset, that he's in mourning, that he's in absolute shock and horror over this edict that has been announced uh, that all the Jews are going to be exterminated. All right? So he goes out and to the midst of the city. Did you notice that at the end of, end of verse 1? He went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. Now, you, you say, why did he go out there and do that? Because you weren't allowed to do it in the palace. He sat in the king's gate, uh, in the king's gate, and had access to go into the royal court, as it were, and, and no sackcloth was permitted to be worn in there. Nobody's going to be mourned in the king's presence. Um, do you remember uh, the, the problem Nehemiah had when Nehemiah was before the king? Remember that? He was the king's cupbearer. And, and he had a sad countenance. And the king says, what is, why are you troubled in your spirit? I've never seen you like this before. And Nehemiah was somewhat afraid of that. Why? Because if you were sad in the king's presence, it was your last day to be sad, okay? Uh, he'd take care of that for you. And so uh, he, he, you just, it was not permitted to be, uh, have sackcloth, ashes, weeping, loud lamentation, nothing like that allowed in the palace. So, he announces it, and, and it was an oriental custom to do so. He announces his lamentation. He announces his, warn, his mourning. He announces uh, his weeping uh, by, by loud crying and loud and bitter wailing. 
That's why the Jews, uh, I don't know if you're in the Holy Land, if you went to the Wailing Wall or not, and people there, and they'll, 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 they'll let out just amazing cries and bitterness and tears, and that's why it got the name the Wailing Wall. And uh, they let everybody know how upset they are and how uh, horrified they are about whatever it is that, that is uh, uh bothering them at the time and so uh, he put he goes into the public square as it were and lets it be known with a loud and bitter cry I think other people would hear other people the news spreads fast and of course the news had been carried out uh, that, that the Jews are going to be exterminated and Mordecai was not the only one to react this way uh, the Bible says verse number three that in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. We don't have an exact number of Jews throughout all the provinces at this time. If you remember from chapter 1, I think there was 127 provinces. But there was uh, the different, differing totals, but in average would have been there's around 15 million Jews. Uh, that's, that's quite a slaughter if you're going to take the lives of 15 million people. And so there's quite an outcry going on throughout the entire kingdom, uh, all of them just like Mordecai. Okay, so we see Mordecai's grief. But then, secondly, I want you to notice this. Esther's compassion for Mordecai. Esther's compassion for Mordecai. Verse 4 Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. So the maids and the chamberlains, they hear Mordecai, they know what's going on, and they go tell Esther. And then the queen was exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him. Now, why would she do that? Because she wanted him to come in and talk to her. And he can't come in there with sackcloth. So hey, here's here's a brand new here's a brand new suit. <laughs> put the suit on. Put this new new clothes on. Uh, I mean, you know, some of the some of you ladies relate to that, I guess. Maybe some guys too. You get feeling down and a little depressed. You're a little discouraged about things. Uh, nothing like going shopping and getting a new outfit. You know, that'll pick your spirits right up. And uh, new new set of threads. You know, uh, he, he sends a brand new suit. You know what he does? He says, I don't want it. And she refuses to take it. And it receives it not. And so we're going to see what Esther does. But she, she, she sends it. And, and as great, I, I, like, I want to point out the compassion she has for Mordecai. She doesn't say, oh, what's he upset about now? Oh, he's always upset about something. She, she has great compassion for him. He's torn his clothes. He's wearing sackcloth and ashes. And, and she's not thinking it's some small sorrow. She knows something big is happening. She apparently, in her cocoon that she's living in, is unaware of the edict that has gone out. She is insulated and, and, and doesn't get out to know what is going on in the kingdom. And so I don't think Esther has any idea here what, is, what has happened. So she, she says she hears about it from her maidens and, and those who came to, to talk, tell her and she wants to help it. She, she, her heart goes out to Mordecai. He, this, is, this has been the one who brought her up. This has been the one who's taken care of her when her parents, the Bible doesn't say what happened to her parents, uh, but uh, her cousin, older cousin Mordecai has taken her in and has brought her up and taught her and helped her and reared her. And so uh, Mordecai, when he refuses to come to her, refuses to come into the palace, now she knows this is something big. Something's really badly wrong. Now what's going to happen? The great thing is, Esther had a friend. You read about that in verse 5. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. She calls a close servant, Hatak. And by the way, his name means a gift. And you know, when you have a friend that you can trust in, a friend that you can rely on, a friend that you know you can confide in, 
you have a great gift from God. And she had a great gift from this man named Haytack. And so he, she goes to find out, I like that, what it was and why it was. Tell me what's going on and tell me why you're so upset. Okay? And that's good communication. And so he goes and he talks to Mordecai. Mordecai tells him about Haman. He tells him about the king's commandment that has been spread throughout the provinces to exterminate all the Jews. And then he also went beyond that. He had a copy of the decree. And he gave the copy of the decree to, Haman, to, to Hatak to show Esther what was going on. And so Hatak came back, told Esther the words of Mordecai. He acted as the messenger between the two. He was their go-between. And Esther had found a servant in whom she could trust. And again, it's a wonderful thing to find a trusted friend. There's very few people in life who you can trust that way and commit yourself to in that way. And such was Hatak for Esther. And so it, it's important. If you're going to be a friend, be a loyal friend. and Be a faithful friend. And be a true friend. And stand by your friends. A friend loveth at all times. A friend loveth at all times. So Esther had a friend. Now, let's look at Mordecai's request and Esther's fear. His request and her fear. Uh, reading in verse number 8. Also, this is where Mordecai gives him a copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and declare it unto her, and to charge her, here it is, here's what he's asking her to do, that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make requests before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. Okay, that's what he told you to tell me. Here I'm going to tell you what to go back and tell him. Okay, now understand, what he's asked her to do is you go in before the king. And you plead for us. Well, now that means something. She's going to have to reveal that she's a Jew. She has not revealed that. The king does not know that. And so now he's, he's asking her something, and, and you'll find out another reason why that's a very fearful thing for her in just a moment. So she, she says, here's what you tend to him. Verse 10, Esther spake unto Hatak, gave him commandment unto Mordecai, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his, and that is to put him, what church? Death. Death penalty. Except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. And so they go and tell Mordecai, Mordecai that. So he asks Esther to speak to the king about Haman's decree to destroy the Jews, and she reminds him, uh, nobody just walks into the king, not even the queen. In fact, I haven't talked to him in 30 days because he hasn't called for me. Uh, and, and it's just, uh, just the arrangement it has. Now, fellas, I wouldn't advise that, okay? I wouldn't try that at home, okay? Uh, it's like these commercials. Don't do this at home. Don't attempt it. Don't attempt that, all right? That's not a good idea. And so uh, if... if uh, you know, if, <laughs> if you're trying, <laughs> I'm thinking, your wife walks into the room, hold up the TV remote, you know, yeah, you can't come in, but uh, you're liable to get hit over the head with it, but uh, oh my, and so that's what he did, and if, if he didn't raise the scepter to welcome you in, uh, then the guards just simply came in and you were quickly um, put to death, so uh, she, was, she said, I'll be risking my life to go in there. Now, historians tell us the king had six favorite people, six people on the list that could come in and out without being called. And uh, evidently, Esther didn't make the top six, okay? So she wasn't on the list uh, to, to, to be able to come in and out of his, um, his presence. And, uh, you know, there's a, there is a great truth here, though. We serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you know what's great? We can come into His presence anytime we want. Uh, we can come boldly to the throne of grace 
and obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, we can come anytime we want, day or night, doesn't matter what's, what, what's happening. We don't have to wait for him to raise the scepter. Uh, we're on the list. Uh, we've got a list and we, we can come and go as we please uh, to the presence of God. Isn't that great? And so uh, here, uh, here is Esther's response. Basically what she's telling Mordecai, Mordecai when she sends his response back through Haytack, you know what she's telling him? No. <laughs> he, he asked her, you go in and you, you, you beg the king, you supplicate him to spare us. Basically, her first response to Mordecai is, that ain't happening. Uh, I'm not going in and risking my life for this. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Basically, she's just saying no. Uh, she's basically saying it's going to be certain death. What you're doing is, Mordecai, you're asking me to commit suicide. Uh, and I'm not quite ready to, to, to die yet. And so she, she was looking at it by sight, not by faith. Okay, That's how, That was her initial reaction. And by the way, don't, don't be too hard on Esther. You and I, we oftentimes look at things first, and we look at it by sight. And then the Lord smites our heart, and we, we realize that we're not looking at it by faith. We're looking at it by sight. And so... Uh, God, will, but be sure of this. Listen, be sure of this. God will bring you and me. He'll bring us to situations that will demand that we rely upon Him. That will make a requirement that we'll have to rely upon Him. There's no other way to go. And so He'll put us in those situations. Oh, God will never give you any more than you can handle. Well, sure He will. Because He doesn't want you to handle it. He wants you to ask Him to help you handle it. You know, it's all. It would, it, last I checked, without Him, we can do nothing. So what are we doing saying, Lord, I got this? I don't have anything. I'm nothing. He's everything. I've got to have Him. In, the Bible doesn't say, in most your ways acknowledge Him. It doesn't say in some of your ways acknowledge Him and in some of the things you've got yourself. No, it says in all thy ways acknowledge Him. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. We need, we need, we need Him all of the time. Not some of the time, all of the time. Alright? Um, and you have to... Yeah, he'll bring you to situations like He did Joshua when they go in and they face Jericho. There's no way possible to penetrate this fortress of a city called Jericho. And especially do it without any weapons. Just walking around. You see, that it, it, they had to do it by faith, not by sight. There's no way Gideon with 300 is going to defeat 100,000 or so Midianites. It ain't going to happen. How can that happen? It has to be by faith. It can't be by sight. And there's situations God will bring you to in your life and you'll look at it and say, man, there's no way. There's no way I can do this. No way this is going to happen. And God will say, well, I'm not asking you to look at it by sight. I'm asking you to look at it by faith. We'll talk about Caleb Sunday morning in Sunday school. We talked about in our teachers meeting tonight that uh, you know, when they came out of the promised land, just Joshua and Caleb were the ones who were willing to look at it by faith. And say, God's able to give us this land. Everybody else was looking by sight. Oh, in our sight, they're big. And in their sight, we're like grasshoppers. And what was their sight and our sight? What, what about God's sight? How did God see things? And so God will bring us to those things because he'll, He wants to give us opportunities to walk by faith and not by sight. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And why were we created? For His pleasure. To please Him. And so He's got to put us in, in, in situations and give us opportunities to exercise faith in Him. Alright? And so that is Mordecai's uh, challenge to her and of course Esther's fear uh, to answer that. But then Mordecai... So the word comes back to Mordecai. Basically, no. I'm not going to go into the king and get killed. Okay? So, Mordecai, he doesn't say, oh well, that's, 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 that's strong-willed Esther. No. 
he, he's going to reply. He's going to reply. He's going to respond. And here he sends a challenge to Esther. A challenge to Esther. He says in verse 13, Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come into the kingdom for such a time as this? Well, here's his challenge. A couple basic things here to consider. First of all, he tells her, you better not be thinking of yourself. Don't think of yourself. That's why we started. Think not with thyself. Don't, don't, Esther, don't just think of yourself. The entire nation's at stake. All of the people are at stake. And don't think of yourself that you're going to escape because you're in the king's palace. You won't. When they exterminate them all, you'll be, you'll be exposed as well. And you will die too. So think about saving others. Okay? You, you may go in and you may end up dying, but you may end up saving everybody else. But if you don't do it and you stay out, you're sure going to die with everybody anyway. So either way you look at it, the only hope you got is for the king to accept you. Otherwise, it's death either way. That's basically what Mordecai is trying to get her to see. But I want you to notice that it's, it's, he's emphasizing to her and emphasizing for us that the Christian life, it, we always get in trouble when we think about ourselves. The Christian life is about others. It's not about yourself. It's always about others. That's why Jesus said, He that loses his life for my sake, the same shall find it. Everybody wants to uh, think about me, me, me. But we, we, we said, Esther, don't just think about yourself. Don't just think about how it's going to affect you. Don't just be looking at you and what, what am I going to do and how am I going to... We get so focused on us. The Christian life is not about us. I get, you know, we get, we get so... We can, we can get so conformed to the world... And we get so thinking about us. The world, you know what the world always teaches? Look out for number. Who's number one? Me. Well, the Christian says, no. Number one isn't me. Number one is God. Who am I? Huh? I'm nothing. Without Jesus, I'm nothing. Okay? And the truth is, I'm not to, I'm not to be thinking about me. In fact, what does the Bible say I'm supposed to do with myself? Build up my self-esteem? No. Die to self. I am crucified with Christ. I'm to die to self. Paul said, I die daily. Well, I just need this. I just think this. I want this. I don't think we should do this. I don't see God doing this. I, 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 I. I have I has been crucified. I was thinking about this. I was praying this. You know, we we use terms like, "Well, I just need some me time." Where, where is that found again? You know what you need? You need God and me time. We don't need me time. We need God and me time. That'll, that'll get, keep me in the right perspective because I'm with God. That's a worldly philosophy. You know what you're saying? It's time, hey, I, I did enough for others. Now it's time for me. Where, where's that again? When Jesus said, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. See? Oh, well, we like it a lot better when we say don't conform to the world and don't drink and don't smoke and don't chew and do all that stuff. But we start talking about conforming to the world the way we think, then it gets real quiet in church like it is right now. Hmm? It gets real quiet. It's like everybody, 
Everybody likes it when, when they're preaching on everybody else's sin, but stay away from mine. Don't, don't get the, you get the meddling and you get in my sin area. No, 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 no. Someone said this, and I, I've said this before here, I believe. You cannot say the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer Jesus taught. You cannot say the Lord's Prayer and even once say I. You cannot say the Lord's Prayer and even once say my. You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer and not pray for another. For when you ask for daily bread, you must include your brother. For others are included in each and every plea. From beginning to the end of it, it does not once say me. What a lesson. That we think of others and we live for others and we serve others and we love others. The happiest person is the one who lives to make others happy. And while you're striving to help others bring happiness into their life, you'll find out happiness has come to visit you. If happiness is the goal, it's like that, that you know, proverbial carrot out in front of you. You keep chasing it and chasing it and chasing it and you never catch it. You never do. Someone says, happiness slips up and surprises the person who forgets their own happiness and seeks to fulfill the needs of others. So he said, Esther, don't think about yourself. Secondly, he said, Esther, if you don't, if you don't step out in faith, someone else will. If you don't do it, he said, if thou altogether holdest thy peace, verse 14, if you hold your peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. So if you don't do this, I'm confident God will raise up a deliverer. God will do something. I think Mordecai, more than Esther, knew of the covenant that God had made with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob, right on down the line. He knew that God's not going to destroy his people. But you understand, he, he, he lets her know that if you don't do it, someone else will. Barnabas has a dissension with Paul and decides, I, I'm not going. And he doesn't go on the second missionary journey. He takes John Mark and sails back towards Cyprus. Oh, what's going to happen? Is the missionary journey ruined? Is the missionary work over? Boy, Paul can't go on without me. Oh yeah, there's somebody named Silas. God will raise up. I wonder, I often wonder, and, and I, we don't know this, maybe we get to heaven, maybe we'll know. But you know, it was Paul and Silas in the jail singing and praying and singing that night when the earthquake came and all the prisoners stayed and the jailer got saved and boy, things began to happen. I wonder, I wonder when Barnabas heard that, I wonder if he thought, that would have been me. I'd have, I'd have been there for that. But I missed out on that. But the work of God goes on. The work of God goes on. Can you remember something? Can all of us remember something for our, humili for our humility? And that is this. God can do without any of us. God can do without any of us. Uh, enlargement and deliverance will arise to His people if, if from another place if it doesn't come by us. I was reading Charles Spurgeon and he said this, if the Lord were tied up to any one man or any one church or any one nation, it were treasonable for that person, church, or nation to be negligent but as the Lord waits not for man, neither tarries for the sons of man, it becomes them to mind what they are doing. He can do without us. When He looked and there was no man, His own arm brought salvation. As it was of old, so it will be again. Remember, the great owner of the vineyard will have fruit at the end of the year, and if yonder tree does not bear it, he'll cut it down. Why let it cumber the ground? 
If the farmers consult their own gain and plot to gain the inheritance for themselves, the Lord will destroy them and let out his vineyard unto other farmers, and he shall, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. He will carry out his purpose. He will fetch home his banished. He will gather together his scattered sheep. He'll cause the earth to be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And if we do not gather in the wonders or spread the knowledge of His grace, then the work will be done by more faithful men. He can do without you. Remember that, O servant of the Lord. Good words. We all get to thinking sometimes we're so all wonderfully important. But the work of God went on before we came on the scene and if the Lord tarries, it'll go on after we're off the scene. It's a sad thing if, and by the way, if you get too proud, or you get to thinking that you're really something, God's perfectly able to set you aside and to show you how well He can get along without you. And you'll miss out on the blessing. So He lets her know, that if you don't do it, Esther, God will raise someone else up who will. Then he tells her this. Perhaps your entire life was given for this moment right here. Perhaps he said you've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knoweth whether thou art come into the kingdom? Esther, this might be the purpose for your life. This may be why you're here on earth. For this very moment. Everybody has a purpose for being here. Nobody, nobody surprised God by showing up. And he didn't say, oh man, I don't know what I'm going to do with Alex. What in the world? I didn't expect him to get saved. No. He knows exactly why you're here. And he has a purpose for each one of us. Do you think it was just by chance that Esther was chosen to be queen? Do you think it's just by chance that, that, her, that something happened to her parents and she had no parents and something happened even to Mordecai's parents? They didn't take Esther in. He was the oldest cousin. What happened to his parents? Maybe they were killed in the invasion. We don't know. None of those details are given to us. But you think all that, all that took place and everybody would say, oh, how terrible, oh, how difficult. No, no, no. You know what? It, it might have been in their eyes, but God was working His plan. All that was going on because Mordecai would be sitting in the king's gate. Esther would have access. All this was taking place because this is what God brought her into the kingdom for. She didn't know it. He didn't realize it. But he's now as this unfolds, Mordecai's got enough sense to say, hey, I think I see what God's done here. That's why you won that contest out of all those women that were entered. That's why you were chosen to be the next king. You were not placed there by chance. You were placed there by God for a purpose. Proverbs 16.9 says, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. God didn't make a mistake. When He made you, and listen to me, God doesn't make a mistake with where He has you today. Don't miss that. So often people spend their life trying to figure out where God wants them to be and wishing they were somewhere else instead of just allowing God to do something in their life right where they are. We're so busy waiting for something else and looking for something else and wanting to be somewhere else, we don't let God do anything with where we are. And say, this is where God has me. God, use me here. Gave the story. I don't remember who I was talking to. I remember, oh, wow, this would have been in the late 70s, probably in the early 80s, probably late 70s. There was a man in Florida who felt the call of God to go up to, I think it was Seattle, Washington. It was one of the bigger cities in Washington. And, and um, he was, of course, going from Florida all the way up you know, crisscrossing the country about as far as you can go to start a church. So he was on staff at a church in Florida and he, you know, they packed everything up and they started the trip across country. And he got as far as 
Pasco, Washington. When he got to Pasco, Washington, he ran out of money. So he never could get to the city he thought he was supposed to go to to start a church. So he said he just started knocking doors in Pasco, Washington and witnessing to people. He started seeing people saved. And he started gathering them together and having a service with them. And pretty soon, he started Riverview Baptist Church. And Dallas Dobson started that church and, and he's in heaven now. And, then, and somebody says, oh, no, no, no. That wasn't where you're supposed to be. No, you know what he said? I, I'll do what I'm supposed to do. I'll let God worry about the where. You think God's looking down and saying, oh, no, he's winning souls there and getting people saved and baptized and teaching the, the things of God. Now, that's not where he's supposed to be. No, God blessed him right there. Now there's a, and by the way, there's another man now that succeeded that. Sam was pastor there when he went to heaven. And it's, it's a, it's a, I think that church there in Riverview Baptist Church in Pasco, Washington, I think they have five or six different services every Sunday to accommodate the crowds and the different cultures. I believe they have Spanish, they have Korean, they have different culture, different services throughout the day. God's just done an amazing work. Hundreds of missionaries supported it. Just, and why? Because what is more important than the where? We get so caught up in where. Just let God worry about the where. You do what you're supposed to do. And God will see to it you're where you're supposed to be. Do the what. And that's what Esther learned. Strange thing for Esther. Foster child of Mordecai and a cousin who had brought her up, a humble Jew, would rise from that lowly rank to be the queen of Persia. But that wasn't just by chance. That was the plan of God. David, taken from the sheepfolds, from taking care of the sheep, that he might be the shepherd of God's people, Israel. Nobody, nobody knows the limit of the possibilities that could surround any one person. What God, if God would choose to use that person. You remember what the Lord Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. I like this. Somebody said, you can set one before. He said, we're a mere zero. We're nothing, yet the Lord can make something of you. Set one before zero, and it's ten directly. Set two or three more zeros after that, and you have something going on. So should the church ever say there's a problem we have we can't solve? Absolutely not. Because with God, all things are possible. All things are possible to him that believeth. Well, let's see what Esther finally does then when, with this answer from Mordecai. Look at verse 15. Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. So now we see Esther's willingness. Esther's willingness. Here's what she said. Go, gather together all the Jews that are at present in Shushan and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. So she agrees to go to the king, but she also realizes God has to intervene. So she instructs Mordecai to have all the Jews fast for three days before she was to go into the king. Don't, don't miss the importance here of fasting and prayer when you need uh, intervention from God. Ezra 8 and verse 21. Ezra said this, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before God to seek of Him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. Ezra got to a point where he didn't know which way to go. He wasn't sure what he ought to do. He was, he was just not sure. You ever been there? He said, here's what we did. We proclaimed a fast. And we fasted and prayed and sought the will of God for us, 
for our little ones and for our substance. Fasting and prayer. Fasting is letting go of the physical that we might grasp hold of the spiritual. It's letting go of the seen that we can grab hold of the unseen. You remember when Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration and the disciples had a man whose son there had been possessed and would throw himself into the fire and in the water and the man had his disciples there and he said, your disciples couldn't heal him. Jesus looked at the man and, and looked at the boy and he commanded the devil to come out of him, the demon, and he did. The disciples went to him later and he said, how come we couldn't cast him out? And Jesus said, this kind cometh not out, but by prayer and fasting. Hmm? This kind. You're, you'll come up with situations in your life that are not normal, that are not just going to be something you pray about, but they're going to be this kind of situation. This kind of answer. This kind of a miracle. And you're going to fast and pray and seek God's will and ask God to intervene in a special way. That's where Esther was. That's where Mordecai was. Asking God, she said, I, I realize I'm the queen, but I realize God has to work. And she completely surrendered her will in the matter. She said, if I perish, I perish. But I will trust God. She's willing to die if necessary. She said, rather than neglect my duty to God and His people, I'll go to the king, cast myself cheerfully and resolutely upon God for my safety and my success. And she did. And we'll find out if the king accepted her when we come back next week. Great story, isn't it? Wow. What a, what a great, great book, the book of Esther. So next week, Esther approaches the king and we'll see if he accepts her or whether she loses her life, all right? So don't miss next week, all right? We'll uh, see what happens to Esther. Let's stand together for a word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, I thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. And thank you, Lord, for this wonderful story of Esther you've put in the Word of God. Lord, tonight I pray that each of us would realize that we've come into this world for such a time as this. Lord, there have been some wonderful Christians that have gone before us, but they're not alive in 2018. We are. They're not here on this earth in 2018. They're not in the United States of America during this time. We are. And so we must have come into this country and we must have come into this life and we must have come into this church and you must have put us into our family for such a time as this. And I pray that we'd be willing to trust you, to rely upon you, that you'll give us all the ability to walk by faith and not by sight, to step out and to trust you that our safety and our protection is from you. And that we'll make a difference as Esther's willing to make a difference. So Lord, use us that way. Dismiss us now with your care. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. Lord, I pray that we'll be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Use us. I pray that Christ will be seen in our life. Others will be drawn unto him. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.